be a part. All right, Kendra and I have a, a big announcement to share with you, some good news. Is that cool? Can we share some news with you today? Uh, we are expecting uh, God to move in a powerful way this year. What? I don't, know, I don't get it. All right, let me say this before I share the news. In all seriousness, as we're celebrating five years uh, of being the lead pastor here, it's been the joy of our lives. And God is doing something really unique in our church. And uh, we, just, we just thank God for it. We thank God. When we began this journey five years ago, there are, there are many of you that are here today that we prayed for. We didn't know you at the time, but we were praying for you, that God would, would, would send you, that, that, that God would allow us to reach you, to partner with you, and, and there's many more. And as we've been talking all year, uh, we've been asking God, you know, for this to be a year of power in our church, power to share the gospel, power to pray for healing, power to see lives changed, to see people reached, and, and God has been answering our prayer since the start of the fall About 160 more of you uh, are attending Heartland this year than last fall. That's about a 15% jump in our church right now. It's awesome. And as we're approaching at the movies, as you know, it's our most popular series of the year. Our attendance always jumps during that. So here's what we're going to do. During, that's the kind of big announcement, I guess. During the four weeks of at the movies this year, we're going to three services, everybody. Come on. Get excited. Get fired up. It's going to be awesome. This is really exciting, okay? Now, let me explain a little bit of the methodology and the idea behind this, okay? Three services, first of all, is going to allow us to make more room for people, for kids, for for allow people to have flexibility in choosing a service. I've said this for years, but anytime people are sitting up top in this third level, we didn't didn't build this building, and so the, the restrooms are not proportional, the kids' classrooms are not proportional. Anytime that happens, and it happens every Sunday now, uh, everything else in our, in our building starts to swell. Everything else in our parking lot starts to swell. So this is going to allow us to have space in classrooms to better minister to kids. You'd say, well, can another kid fit? We could fit a, a couple more kids in a classroom, but that's not the question. The question is, can we properly teach them about Jesus? When there's 17 toddlers in a room, can we teach them about Jesus? You know, it's, they're like, no, nah, 12 would be better, you know? So we're going we're gonna to make it a little bit easier. It's going to make parking a little bit easier. It's going to make the bathroom lines a little bit shorter. But more importantly, it's going to allow us to connect with more people and keep services at a size where we can connect with people. And this is important. This is going to allow us, for this four-week period, what we're going to be doing is it's going to allow us a little bit of a test run. Everybody say test run. We're going to test this. We're going to see how it feels, okay? So let me make sure you hear me saying this today. We're not doing this permanently for now. We're going to do this for four weeks during At The Movies. And then after At The Movies ends, we're going to jump back to two, okay? And Doing this means more opportunities to, to reach people. It also means more opportunities to serve. hey oh, hey oh. So we need you. If you're just hanging on the sidelines right now, God's doing something in this church. We need you. And so let's believe that we're going to reach more people than we've ever reached before. So we're gonna, here's how we're going to do this. We're going to do 9 a.m., 1030 and noon. Okay, everybody say 9.30. I mean, nine. no, no, don't say that. Don't do that. It's going to go in a video. Um, say 9 a.m., 10.30, noon. All right, we're going to do this, and we're going to try this, and we're going to see how it goes. And God willing, we're going to reach more people during At The Movies this year than we've ever reached as a church. Amen, everybody? All right. Enough of all that. If you got your Bibles, go to Acts chapter 11 today. It's just going to become a bit when we go into a new chapter. Everybody's going to, well, I got good news. We're going to complete an entire chapter today. It's going to be great. Two weeks in a row. I'm really excited about teaching this one. Uh, I think this is, I just think this is great. Um, Just a point of review, last week, Those of you who are new to our church, I guess I should say this. At the beginning of the year, I kind of told everybody that I felt like God spoke to me in August of last year and told me that this was going to be a year of power in our church. And as I prayed about what that looked like, I felt the Holy Spirit tell me, lead the entire church through the book of Acts. Uh, I've never done anything like this before. Series have always been like four weeks, five weeks around here. 
And so I sat out, set out to, to do, to teach the entire book of Acts in one year. And I have failed miserably. Um, <laughs> And we are only on Acts chapter 11. So we're going to go uh, another week or so, and then we're going to take a break, and we're going to pick back up next year. It's been really kind of, la- next year is going to look a whole lot like this year, if I'm just going to be honest. And we take little breaks throughout the year, and so here we are, Acts chapter 11. And if you, uh, if you were here last week, just as a point of review, we saw a major turning point with the spreading of the gospel. In fact, prior to chapter 10, the gospel... Uh, only goes to people who are of Jewish descent, whether it's Jewish people in the Jerusalem area or Samaritan people who were of Jewish descent. But in chapter 10, what we saw last week, for the very first time, the gospel goes to the Gentiles. And from here on, the gospel is going to spread to the in- it's going to spread across the entire world. And, and when you get to Acts 11, something I want you to know is that the first 18 verses essentially recounts everything that happens in Acts 10. Because what happens is Peter goes back to Judea and he's telling the story about what happened to the apostles and the believers. And they cannot believe it. They really start kind of getting on to him initially because they can't believe that he's eaten with Gentiles. That he's actually preached the gospel to Gentiles. That, and, and he begins to tell them the story. No, 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 guys, something crazy has happened. The Holy Spirit has been poured out like it was on us. It's been poured out on them too. And, and, and I want you to think about this, that because he told the story in Acts chapter 10, Luke really doesn't have to include this in, in the narrative. He, he doesn't have to, but I think he does it intentionally because he wants to be abundantly clear that the gospel is for everyone. It's not just for one group of people. It's not just for the rich, it's not just for the poor, it's not for the popular. Anybody who calls upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ can be saved. Amen, everybody? So I'm not going to spend much time recounting it. Uh, We looked at it last week. It's enough to say that Peter tells them what what happened, and then this happens. Uh, When the others heard this, they stopped objecting, they began to praise God. They said, we can see that God has also given the Gentiles the privilege of repenting of their sins and receiving eternal life. So the gospel's for everyone. So you can read through that that account if you want to, the first 18 verses. I would really encourage you to. But what I really want to focus on today is Acts 11, 19, and all the way through the end of Acts. Because what we're going to get here is a picture of the very first Gentile church in a town called Antioch. The church of Antioch would become a great church. It would become a church of revival, a a church of prayer, a church of great teaching. In fact, there were five primary teachers at this church. Paul was one of them. Barnabas was one of them. And it was a church that believed in sending people out to share the gospel. And so as we focus on the second half of Acts chapter 11, the central character in the story is a man named Barnabas, who we've looked at previously. Remember, we saw Barnabas in Acts chapter 4. We saw him in Acts chapter 9. And now we're going to see him sent by the apostles to help bring leadership into the church of Antioch. And I have to tell you this right off the bat as we study this. We're going to see some things about Barnabas' leadership and that, that strengthened the church. And the more that I just want to say this, the more that I learn about Barnabas, the more that I absolutely love him in Scripture. Barnabas was not a character that would have been at the forefront, kind of of like a hero of the Bible for me. I was telling a friend a couple of days ago, I think I might have a book in me about Barnabas. That's how passionate I am about him. Uh, I love him this year. He has come alive to me in scripture. And we're going to read about him. We're going to see some some values. We're going to see some behaviors. And I want to say it this way. These behaviors and these values can make a massive difference in a church. Any church. Any church that is experiencing a move of God. In fact, when you look at Acts 11.24, you're going to see two descriptions about Barnabas that really stand out. The Bible says that he is a good man, and the Bible says that he is a man that is full of the Holy Spirit and full of faith. And as you begin to read through the second half of Acts 11, you realize that there were several things about his life that stand out. And so I just want to say this right off the bat today. This is a leadership message today. 
This is, I'm calling out some greatness in every single person in this room. This message is for any man or any woman that has ever prayed this prayer. God, you can use me to build your church. Would you please use me to build your church? I'm sitting down here today, and uh, Ryan, by the way, I want to thank Ryan for being here. Was he not amazing? Like, I started following his ministry several years ago uh, on, on uh, Instagram, and I think he's on TikTok. He, he does this thing, I'll, I'll talk about it more, but he has a, really a prophetic singing ministry that he goes into the streets and does this. If you've never followed him on social media, you've got to. I'm, you'll cry your eyes out as you're watching what he's doing uh, and ministering to people who are far from God. But anybody, as he's singing that song, You Can Use Me, Lord, which we've been, sing, we've been singing in our church lately, and I'm sitting there, I'm thinking, Ryan's here who sings the song, you know, that I listen to all the time. And we're singing this, and I'm preaching about it, and my head's exploding. You know, like, God, you're just lining this up right now. This message is for all of those kind of people who say, God, you can use me. Would you use me? I've had, I've had some people, I've had some great men come up to me and say, Pastor Dusty, how can I come alongside of you? How can I strengthen the church? What do you need from me? This message is to help you see what I need from you today. And I just couldn't plan it. It's the perfect message on the perfect day. We're celebrating five years. Like, I just want, you're stuck with us for good, for bad, for ugly. You know, you're stuck with us. We're here. But at the same time, the newness has worn off. Like, you, you know, some of you are kind of tired of me. You know, like we're out of the honeymoon period. And in a season where our church is growing, what this season does is it beckons something out of us. It calls us to more. And if we want to see the continuation of God using our church to reach people, then we have to be willing to grow. And we have to be willing to let leadership be built in our lives. We got to, the word we would use is you got to level up. <laughs> you got to level up right now. And so what I want to do for just a few minutes is look at seven characteristics of Barnabas' life that strengthened the church. And my prayer is, is that you'll take notes. We're going to go through these very quickly today. Uh, and, and this will be your prayer. God, help me in these seven areas of my life. Because I believe growing in these seven areas is not only God's will, I believe it'll help you change people's lives around you. Are you ready today? Seven characteristics to note uh, from the life of Barnabas. And so, seven, there it is, seven, in case you need to see it. Seven characteristics of Barnabas that strengthen the church. I mean, put this down, map it out, ask God to teach this to you in your life. The first one is this is that Barnabas was a man that cared about others. He cared about others. In, in Acts eleven nineteen, it says this, Now those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word only among Jews. So what this does is it takes us back to Acts chapter 8, where Stephen was martyred. He becomes the very first church martyr. And then as a result of that, the church that's there in Jerusalem begins to scatter. The, the scripture goes on, it says, Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. So, again, I've done this a few times. Let me just show you. I know we're geeking out here, but let me just show you a map so that you can kind of get this in your head, like what's happening here, okay? So down here is Jerusalem, right? Here is Cyprus. I would really like to go here sometime. Never been there before. Up here is Syrian Antioch, okay? Caesarea is down here. Uh, way over here would have been another area, uh, Cyrene. Uh, and so people were traveling from Cyprus, Cyrene, and they were going all the way up into Antioch, okay? And they were sharing the gospel, and a church would be started here. Now, not just one church, but listen to me, one of the great churches of the New Testament, where people are going to start being healed, where people are going to get saved. And the scripture goes on and it says, news of this reached the church in Jerusalem and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. So words getting out about this church. And, and, and think about this. I, you really have to think about this. They've got, in Jerusalem, they've got Peter and James and John. They've got all the disciples. They've got Philip. They've got everybody. Think about all the people that they could have sent to Antioch. And they sent Barnabas. And why did they send Barnabas? Here's what I think. I think it's because he had a reputation for caring for people. 
We see this in Acts chapter 9. When, when nobody wanted anything to do with this man Saul, who's about to become known as Paul, Nobody wants to talk with him. Nobody wants to meet with him. Nobody wants to eat with him. All the disciples, all the apostles, they're afraid of him because he's been a persecutor of Christians. There was one man that had the nerve to take a risk on Paul, who stepped out of fear, who believed that Paul had changed before anybody else did. Who was that man? It was Barnabas. Because of Barnabas, Paul was introduced to the apostles and began a relationship that changed him and grew him. You see this in Acts chapter 4, where he cares about the church so much Barnabas does. The church is growing, and because the church is growing, there are needs, and and the church is trying to reach all the needs and, and trying to resource all these needs, but they don't have enough. And so what does Barnabas do? In Acts chapter 4, he sells a field. He gives all the money to the apostles. He says to them, use this to meet needs. Why? Because he cared about people. And I just want to say this to every person in this room. Let me tell you what's going to happen here for this church. If we ask for revival, then God's going to send us people. This past Sunday night at our Welcome to Church party, I left so encouraged as I just was hearing stories of people's lives who've come into this church dealing with addiction, dealing with difficulty, dealing with stress. They've walked in the door. So many people this past Sunday night telling me, God is doing something in my life at this church. Amazing stories. Several times people just began to cry. Said, you you, you have to know, this church is coming to my life at a time that I needed it most. Let me me tell you what's going to happen. God will send through, or God will send to us these kinds of people to encourage them, to love them, to welcome them, to reach out to them. The need of the hour is for an army of people who will do more than just come to church and just leave. But will say, I'm here to be used by God. God, if you can use anything, use me. Come on and clap your hands all over the room for that. And listen to me, listen to me. It's so important that you get this. The first way you're used in the body of Christ is not on a camera, It's not standing on a stage. It's not leading worship. The way it starts is you loving people and being willing to care for people you've never met before. Just saying, I've got room in my life to make room for other people. I've got room in my life to go to a coffee. I've got room in my life to invite somebody to lunch. I've got room in my life to invite somebody around my dinner table, into my home, to just care for people. To which some people say, well, Dusty, I've got needs. And I'm not very outgoing. Well, first of all, what I've learned is that when I take care of God's business, he just takes care of my business. And as far as not being outgoing... What I want you to know, it does not appear that Barnabas was an extrovert. It does not appear that he was outgoing. What it appears that he was, though, is he was just kind and he cared for people. And when you're kind and you care for people, you you start forgetting about what you can't do. The, The best thing that can happen to us is for us to stop focusing on ourselves all the time. Get your eyes on Jesus. Get your eyes on the people that God is sending and love them. Come on, love them in the name of Jesus. Just love them. If you're willing to do that, it'll change people's life. That builds God's great church. And I just think that when we think about God using us, we're too worried about titles. We're too worried about positions. And we're not enough concerned about people. As the investment, that's where it starts. The second thing is is that he served where there was a need. He served where there was a need. Acts 11.22 says, news of this reached the church in Jerusalem. They sent Barnabas to Antioch. They they asked him to go and he went. There wasn't a sense, any sense in scripture of Barnabas being like, well, you know, I'll let you know in a week. He didn't say, well, you know, I've never been there before. You know, I don't, I don't really, they don't know me. I don't know them. You know, that they probably don't really even need me. I mean, what if I interfere? He, none of that. There was a need. They asked him to go meet the need, and he did. 
And really, that's the beginning of the greatest ministry we'll ever know, when there is needs and we just meet needs. You say, well, well how do I know if somebody has a need? If they're breathing. I mean, show up for a Saturday serve sometime on a first or third Saturday. You, you'll see the need. Step into a classroom. You, you'll see the need. Start serving at Welcome to Church Party. You'll see the need. In just a moment, or in Scripture later on in verse 24, like I said, the description of Barnabas, a man full of the Holy Spirit, a man full of faith. When you choose to be a man or a woman like that, there's a humility, there's a willingness, there's a yielding to God, to go wherever there are needs. And I hope that you know this, that the Spirit is always sending us to people. The, the more full of the Spirit we are, the more yielded we are to God to be His vessels. I mean, think about this. If we follow the leading of God, we will be in the presence of God, have access to the power of God, and as a result experience the blessing of God. Let me just say this, if you really believed that, let me tell you what you'd be doing. You'd be busting down the doors of every need that you can find. And I just want, I just want to get this revelation into your heart to you. Say yes and watch what he'll do in your life. It'll change your life. Look, for, for years in the church, what we've done, good or bad, I don't really know, I, I'm sort of indifferent, we, we talk about serving in our passions and serving in our gifts. And I think that's totally fine to do that. And I, I do think long-term God will give you passion to serve in the places that he's equipped you and enabled you. But, but if we only ever serve there, are we really ever truly ever serving God out of our preferences? Outside of our preferences? Be willing to go where there's a need. And I just want you to be full of faith. In fact, I was, I was praying the other day. I told Kendra a couple of days ago, I've just had this sense like, like, God never let me be too big to do the little things. And I've just felt the Lord been reminding me of that all over again, you know. But be there for people. Meet needs for people. Watch what God will do in your life through your willingness to meet the needs. God will transform their life, but it will transform yours too. The third thing is this, that he saw the grace of God in a very imperfect church. I want to read this to you. It says this in Acts eleven twenty three that when he arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad. Because he was full of faith, because he was full of the Holy Spirit, he was able to see beyond the imperfections of a young church. And if you can just imagine this very young church, this Gentile church, I'm sure it was full of imperfections. Listen, it goes without saying there is no perfect church because there are no perfect people. This is not a perfect church by far. Think, well, it seems pretty awesome. Well, come long enough. We'll screw it up for you. I've done this program in the past called Leadership University where I've, I've really worked hard to build leaders and, you know, help, help train the next generation of leaders. And, and, a, and a part of that that I do, I do this short teaching as part of a greater uh, set of teaching on emotional health. And I actually want to take just a second and I want to do what I do in Leadership University because I think this is really helpful because here's what I want you to know. Every church is an imperfect church. I don't care how cool they look on Instagram. I don't care how big they are. I don't care how fast they've grown. I, all, they all have warts. They have imperfections. They have seasons in their church that are hard. Seasons that are hard for the church. And here's the issue with a lot of people is they like a church. They actually think, I love this church, but then they get into the church. They stay long enough where a difficult season ramps up in their life or something happens and all of a sudden they get to this point where they don't feel what they initially felt. And they think something's wrong. God, God must not be moving. Things must be falling apart. I must not have heard from God about this church. My season, it's a very popular phrase, my season must be coming to an end. Can I just say this? There were no seasons in the first church. My season at this church. It was the only church. 
So what I want to do for just a second is I want to describe the typical life cycle of a believer when it comes to their relationship with church. I think this teaching is so helpful for people. Because if you stay in a church long enough, you're going to go through this picture. In, in my mind, you'll go through it, no doubt. I'm going to do it really quickly. The first thing that happens in the life of a church is somebody comes from the very first time and they connect. This is the initial connecting. You begin attending. And you think, this is amazing. You start meeting people, and you're like, I love all the people here. <laughs> Church feels like home. You know, you, you're weeping. I found my place. You say things to your friends like, I've never been to a church where the Spirit of God moves more. It's, it's so amazing. And then, as a result of that, you begin. You, you begin to reach. You partner with the church, you join together to, a, to attempt to accomplish the vision. You, you're trying to reach, you know, the kingdom of God. And for a while, things are amazing. This can last months. It can last even years. Things are great. The church is blessing you. You're being a blessing. But then something happens somewhere along the way. And I don't know what it is or where it happens. But you move into this next place, which is called Reality. Suddenly there's trouble in paradise. Everything is not quite as good as you thought. There's been a fallout with someone that you're in relationship with in a small group or a leader did not meet your needs or they let you down or the pastor preached on politics. You don't get the leadership position. You feel like you're in a spiritual rut. You start to think things like, I feel like I'm just going through the motions. Here's what I want to say to you. All of that in a church is normal. If you stay at a church long enough, what felt amazing at first can become to feel normalized at times. But for many people who've not had a long relationship with the church, this can be a startling feeling. I mean, it used to make me feel amazing. Why does it make me feel amazing anymore? Now it feels like things are monotonous. And, and it's here that what begins to happen is you're faced with a reality, and then you have to do something called react. And what you do here determines a lot about your relationship with your church or your relationship with future churches. And what you do here is so pivotal in your faith walk when it comes to your relationship with the body of Christ. Because the very first thing that you can do is retract. The church disappointed me, so the church must not be safe. I don't like this. I don't feel like I'm hearing from God. And when that happens, that almost always leads to this. I hop to another church. I go find another place. I gotta find my new church. I gotta find my new season. Pastor, my season has come to an end. I've been feeling in my spirit lately like I'm not supposed to be here. For some people, though, they don't do that. They don't just reject, re retract. They get super unhealthy, and then they start to deconstruct. This is what we've seen a lot in the church over the last several years. Churches hurt people. Churches do things that are unhealthy. Because if you go to a church long enough, you're going to find out it's imperfect. And some people just take it all the way to the end. Well, well now I'm hurt. And now, I don't know if I really ever believed. Churches are all bad. I should have never believed and been a part of the church. I wasted all my time. And there's this anger and this unforgiveness and crisis and angry tweets. And, and it's often very detrimental for a faith walk. But let me tell you that there's another option for you when it comes to your relationship with the church is that you can, you can recommit. Right. Let me tell you what happens when you recommit. You, this is what you're saying. You're saying, oh, this church hurt me or someone in the church hurt me. But the church isn't perfect. And I know that it's not, and I know that God's called me here. I know this is where I'm called to stand and make a difference. I'm called to walk with my pastor, to walk alongside the leaders, to be a part of building God's community. And so I'm going to dig in, baby. I'm going to have grace for imperfections. I'm going to find a way to make a difference. And I'm going to keep going. Now listen to me. Here's what I'll say. People who have lasted in churches. I'm just curious. If you've been at this church longer than 20 years, just raise your hand. Just raise your hand. If you've been at the church longer than 30 years, 
Raise your hand. Okay, now listen to me. These people that are raising their hands, they've done this probably several times in the life of this church. Ask them after the service day. Did that relate to you? Yeah. Pastor Dusty became the pastor. I went through this. (laughs) And I promise you, they've done this probably 10 times, five times. And they keep coming back to this place where when I recommit, I connect and reach all over again. They've done it. Listen, the reason I teach you this is because most people don't have the grace, nor do they have the spiritual awareness to realize this. That's why statistics tell us that 80% of a normal church's attendance in an American church changes every seven years. The average person will lose seven close and quality relationships over the course of their entire life. The average pastor loses seven close and quality relationships every year. Why am I telling you this? Number one, I want you to last in a life-giving church. And number two, I want to avoid a nervous breakdown. Because the, the statistics say that 80% of you will not be sitting in this room seven years from now. And I just, I have come to this place where, no, that's not the heart of God, number one. And number two, if we can teach what a healthy church looks like, it can help people to dig in and to go after God with all of their heart. Yeah. Amen, everybody? Amen. So, so listen, what do, you, what do you see when you look at the church? Do you only see its problems? Listen, it takes no prophetic gift or divine insight to find the cow patties and the pastor of the church. (laughs) But it does take a grace and a faith to look at something that's imperfect and to say, I'm going to refuse to only focus on what's wrong. I'm going to choose to focus on what's right. I'm going to pray, and I'm going to focus on the grace of God to help me build God's great church. Like a tree that's planted by the water, I will stand strong all the days of my life. Now listen, are there times where those kind of things happen? Are there times where seasons end, seasons end? Of course, okay? But on the most part here, what I'm trying to do is help a majority of people. All right, here's the fourth thing. I'm going to go quickly. The fourth thing is that he encouraged people. Go back to the book of Acts. It says this, when he arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad and he encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all of their hearts. And a great number of people were brought to the Lord. So Barnabas is not just a good man. He was a glad man. He was a happy man. There was joy about his life. He was celebrating others. He was encouraging others. I mean, think about this. Barnabas' real name was Joseph. But he's such an encourager that the apostles changed his name to Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He was an encourager. That's that's what he does all throughout the book of Acts. He's encouraging people in need by selling the field. He's encouraging Paul. He's encouraging Antioch. He's encouraging John Mark. And the results are that people are getting saved because people want to be in a place that's encouraging. People want to be in a place that builds faith, that offers healing, and that offers hope. You can encourage people with smiles. You can encourage people with a positive attitude. You can encourage people with speaking faith over their situation. I love it. There are people like that out in our lobby every single week. I love them. It's like you see them just ding, they just got the smile. You say, are they ever having a bad day? You bet they are. But what they know is I'm here to help somebody else in their spirit right now. You know what a positive attitude and a smile does? It sets people at ease. And if you're at ease, what begins to happen is your heart begins to open. So just compliment people. Thank them for serving you. Tell people, you know, how good they look. You know, that, that you're grateful for their sacrifice. Offer to buy somebody's coffee. Or what you could do every now and then is when they come in the aisle, just, I know this is really stretching it right now, but offer them your aisle seat. 
Okay, I'm sorry. I asked too much. I... Just looking for an amen back here uh, somewhere else. Now listen, it's easy to talk about this because I, I'm not kidding you. I see a million examples of it every week in our church. But I just think it's a good reminder of us today. Dusty, how can I come alongside you? Hey, be of good cheer. Be an encourager. Number five, I love this one, is he made room for young leaders. He made room. Look at this. It says this, then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. And the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. A little bit of trivia there for you. Where does the name Christians come from? You know what a Christian means? It means little Christ. They said, you're acting like Jesus. So they called them Christians. Isn't that cool? And so they're they're making this massive impact. And what I find interesting is the people were, were getting saved. And when Barnabas shows up, now lots of people are getting saved. I think it would have been really easy for Barnabas to have said, well, you know, now's my time, baby. <laughs> you guys seen my, y'all seen my Instagram followers? It's growing like crazy right now. Thanks, Peter, for sending me here. I'm the guy here now. But instead of caring about status, Barnabas goes and he looks for Saul. Paul brings him back knowing that Paul's going to outshine him in intellect. Paul's going to outshine him in teaching ability. Paul's going to outshine him in passion. He knows that Paul knows the word of God ten times better than him. And by going and getting Paul... With this decision, it will forever cement his status as a second chair leader in church history. Listen, very few people are willing to invite others who will outshine them themselves. Barnabas' humility amazes me. And when we get to Acts 13, I'm going to show you this here in the weeks ahead, in 2025. I'm going to show you. The progression in scripture, how it's Barnabas, then it's Barnabas and Paul, then it's Paul and Barnabas, and then it's just Paul. I was thinking about this this week on this kind of milestone weekend. I have to be honest with you, the only reason I'm standing up here today is because Pastor Dan was a Barnabas in my life. Maybe for me. There were many Sundays, I'm sure, that some of you were looking at me and you were thinking as I was younger, I wish they'd get this scrawny little guy off the stage (laughs) so Pastor Dan could sing. (laughs) And some of you, you do this from time to time. You just remind me. You know, how was last week? It was amazing. Pastor Dan sang. (laughs) It's almost like you can't do that. I know, but just in case you've ever wondered it, I'm no fool. I'm standing on a stage that I didn't build. I was given opportunities from a young age that I didn't deserve. In fact, my entire life, great men and women of faith around me have allowed me seats at tables that I did not belong at. But our church has stayed strong through multiple transitions because leaders before us gave and made room for us. And as God enables us, we will do that too. Amen, everybody. I want the team to come. I've got to go, I've got to go quickly. But insecure leaders are unable to share success. Secure leaders are not afraid of somebody else getting the credit. It's amazing what we can do when we don't care who gets the credit. It's amazing how great our team can be when nobody cares who gets the solos. When we don't care who has the titles. All we care about is when someone lifts their hands and says, I want to follow Jesus for the rest of my life. And as we watch the progression of Barnabas and Paul, what we see is that Paul does not do things like Barnabas does. 
He does them very differently. Both are used incredibly of God. Listen, I want to say this about this next generation. They're not going to say it like you say it. They're not going to do it like you do it. But he will raise up a generation of new leaders, and we are called to champion them in this church. Come on, everybody. Come on and clap your hands. Let's be a champion for what God is building here. Number six, he was patient with the failures of others. Now listen, we're not going to see this one in Scripture today, but I've added it because we're going to see this begin to happen in Acts 13. We're going to see Paul and John Mark have some significant issues, so much that Paul doesn't want to travel with Mark any, anymore. So you're going to have to kind of bookmark this, and then I'm going to show you how Barnabas is a voice of patience in the middle of it all. But the reason I'm bringing this up today is, is this. In any move of God, there are going to be people who fail. There are going to be people who sin. There are going to be people who hurt you. And the question you have to ask is, how are you going to handle that? Are you going to be the kind of person that gives in to cancel culture? Or are we going to do what the Bible says? Galatians 6 says it this way. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person. Come on, everybody say this word. Gently. But watch yourselves. Or you also may be tempted. In other words, it's saying, if you're the kind of person that's boisterous and loud and wants to throw everybody to the wayside... Better be careful. Scripture goes on, carry each other's burdens. And in this way, you'll fulfill the law of Christ. If anybody thinks that there's something, when they're not, they deceive themselves. Now listen, I'm not talking about pastors here. We are called to a higher standard. But I am talking about people in the church. They're going to fall. And you got to love them. you got to care for them. you got to be patient with them. You gotta be kind with them. You gotta be responsible to correct them in loving ways. I, I'm not advocating a loose view of sin by any stretch of the imagination. I think we have a responsibility to correct sin. But I'm just advocating a Galatians 6 way in our response to it. The last one is this is that he respected prophetic words. Let me show you this and it'll close today. During this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them, named Agabus, stood up. And through the Spirit, predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. This happened during the reign of Claudius. The disciples, as each one was able, decided to provide help for the brothers and sisters living in Judea. This they did, sending their gift to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. So Agabus says there's going to be a big famine. And they took it to heart, and, and they gave an offering to help people in Judea. They believed in the prophetic. Listen, I want to say this about the prophetic today. 1 Corinthians 14, Paul says this. He says, follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially prophecy. And I know the tendency of some people is to think, well, you know, I don't, I don't trust churches, and so I'm just going to read my, my, my own Bible, and God will show me what to do, and I'll just kind of do my own thing. And, and hopefully what you learn from the Old Testament is that in the Old Testament, the, the people needed... Uh, the prophetic in their life in a powerful way. In fact, the, the prophetic holds a special place in the word of God. Now, it's different in the Old Testament and, and in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, prophets were calling people back to God. In the New Testament, the prophets are calling people to strengthen and edify and encourage them. And God may speak to you and, and to the church and Kendra and I. And, and, and I, what I'm asking God is for the prophetic in our church. I want it. I don't know if you noticed it, but Ryan was up here today. He was flowing in the prophetic in worship. And I just want to say this. If you ever feel like God's giving you a word, Pastor Dusty, I, I feel like God's giving me a word. What do I do with it? Well, here's what I want you to do. I want you to write it down and then give it to us. And let me tell you what we'll do. Okay, first, Kendra and I will share it with one another. Just what do you think? How's this rep? you know, reverberating with you. Then we'll share it with people close to us so that they can evaluate if the Lord is speaking through it. That's what 1 Thessalonians 5 tells us. Don't quench the spirit. Don't treat prophecies with contempt. But come on, everybody say it. Test them all. Hold on to what is good. Reject every kind of evil. Listen, not every prophetic word somebody's ever given you is a good word. So you have to test the word. 
Because the fact of the matter is this. In life, you will attract whatever you value. So if you're a gossip, let me tell you what you're going to attract. You're going to attract gossip. So you have to weigh it. You have to evaluate it. And we want to be a church. The reason I'm telling you that is we want to be a church that celebrates prophecy. We want to be a church that, that lives in prophecy. So would you just be open to it? Saying, Lord, speak to me. Speak through me. If you value people who seek God, who are lovers of God, let me just tell you, that's who you'll attract. If you value prophecy, you'll attract it. And so as we're in the supernatural season, I believe that God is going to speak to us supernaturally. And that's what I've been praying for. Amen, everybody. Seven characteristics of Barnabas' life that strengthen the church. And I think the takeaway is this. God is visiting us in a unique way right now. And the response isn't to sit back, but rather to engage. To, to say, God, I want to be a part of what you're doing. I, I, I want to care for people. I want to encourage people. I, I want to get behind it. I, I, I want to serve. I want to love. I want to pray. I want to build. It's not just about me. Now listen, is it about you? Yes. But it's not just about you. So lean in because God is working. And as he begins to work, I believe the best is yet to come. Amen, everybody? Come on, would you clap your hands for God's word all over the room today? Why don't you stand on your feet with me today? Kind of a unique place to end, but we're just going to end in this place right now. Here in a moment, I'm going to pray for you. I'm just curious, how many of you in the room... You would say, I just feel like God lately has been stirring me for more in my life. How many of you? Would you just lift your hands right now? Look at the hands all over the street. Just been stirring my heart. Just been saying, God, whatever you want to do right now, use me. Stir my heart. Use my gifts. Use my passions. I believe that's what he wants to do to, today. I just want to encourage some of you right now. You're in a season right now. Man, I feel the Holy Spirit in this. You're in a season right now that if you'll give God your yes and be obedient, you're going to do things in the name of Jesus that you never imagined you could do. God's going to use you in neighborhoods, in schools, not just in churches, business places. I talked to a sweet lady of our church on a Wednesday about, about a month ago. She told me, Pastor Dusty, I've been just feeling a, a need to pray for my school, but I'm terrified because in our school as a teacher, you're really not supposed to be praying. I said, let's ask the Holy Spirit. Let's lean into that. She came to me this past week. She said, Pastor Dusty, I want you to know that I asked a teacher. I got the boldness, and I said, would you come pray with me? And we've been praying every day at lunch. She said, then this past week, another teacher found out, and now three of us have started praying and interceding for our school. We tend to focus on the stage gifts. But there's a spirit of intercession that started rising up in this school all of a sudden. And I'm believing, I'm just speaking over her school right now, that it's going to be transformed because of the prayers that they're praying. And that more teachers are going to get on board. And a spirit of prayer is going to break out on that staff. And man, people are going to get saved because of the things they're saying. And get, you just never know how God wants to use you. Father, would you just use us? You can use me, Lord. Use me for your kingdom. Use me for your purpose. Father, I ask right now that the prophetic call of the Holy Spirit would be unleashed on every person in this room right now. Let the power of God be poured out of them. Lord, let these characteristics strengthen the church and every single one of us. And may we see you do an amazing thing through your church, God. Use every single person. Build every gift. Build confidence in them to be the hands and feet of Jesus. And we thank you for this now. In Jesus' name we pray. Come on, and everybody clap your hands and say amen to that today. Listen, friends, our team's about to worship you out of here. I want to thank you for coming. If you'd like to give, there are boxes in the hallways that you can give in. Thank you for putting God first in your giving and allowing us to reach so many kids and students and people for the gospel. You're a part of what we're doing here through your giving. It's part of our worship. And so God bless you today. Have a great rest of your Sunday. Come on, team. Let's sing them out as they leave today. Hallelujah. Have a great Sunday, everybody.